This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 25th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how the legislature's House Coalition is consistently masking from the public critical information in its analysis of various proposed fiscal solutions. Second, we dig down into the information the news miner just skimmed over in its story on Representative Adam Wool's proposed flat tax. And third, we take a first look at the implications of Exxon's decision to hand over operatorship of Point Thompson to Hillcorp. And by the way, for those of you watching this podcast on YouTube, this week, Michael and I try something new with me joining him by live video feed via Skype. As you will see when you watch, we still need to work out a few kinks before next week, but it seemed to work out better than not for the first try. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's dive into some stuff here. You've got some very interesting top three items uh, that uh, you want to talk about. Uh, First and foremost, let's dive into it with this discussion on how Ledge Finance and the House uh, majority have basically wasted a year of our time. That's your number one on the weekly top three. Michael, last week, uh, uh, Ledge Finance did presentations in front of House Ways and Means uh, and in front of House uh, Finance, the House Finance Committee. And it was intended, I think, as a comprehensive review of all of the permanent fund uh, proposals that have been made, uh, bills that have been submitted over the course of the uh, special, well, special session, but but including the regular session, because a lot of those bills got got re-upped uh, during the special session. And it was a, a, a lengthy uh, 33 page slide deck that went into the detail of each of the proposed bills, the POMV bills, the POMV 5050, POMV 2575, uh, Jonathan Christ Tompkins, just a, a constitutionalization of the POMV, statutory constitutional, all of the bills dealing with, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, dealing with the uh, with the the PFD uh, that have been submitted, but there was one characteristic of that presentation and every presentation that has been made uh, this year, regular session, special sessions, one characteristic that just stood out to me, and that was every presentation was about how much was only about how much. The, uh, the particular bill raised for government, how much of the, of, the, of the permanent fund earnings or how much of the permanent fund revenue, revenue from the permanent fund went to government. There was no presentation, there was no analysis in either this presentation that they did this past week, that Ledge Finance did this past week, or frankly, in any of the presentations that Ledge Finance has done for either the House or the Senate over the course uh, of the uh, of the sessions uh, on the impact of those transfers of the impact of those bills on Alaska families uh, and on the overall Alaska economy. It's not like they don't have a template for how to do it. In 2016, ICER did a detailed analysis of all of the impact of various revenue options, seven, I think, of uh, various revenue options, uh, including including changes to the permanent fund. Uh, did a detailed uh, analysis of the impact of those changes on the Alaska economy. 
In 2017, ITEF, the Institute, Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy, a national think tank, came in and did an analysis of the impact of all of those of, of, of various revenue options on Alaska families uh, and, and, and a distributional impact that showed what the impact was on middle and lower income as well as upper income uh, Alaska families of the various revenue options. There are templates out there. There are analyses out there that tell you how to do this stuff. And I know for a certainty that ledge finance has those tools. They know they're aware of those tools. They have those tools. They could use those tools. Uh, and I know for a certainty that, uh, that ledge finance uh, could do it. But throughout this entire year, all of the analyses they've done about what you do with the permanent fund or any of the revenue options, all of that analysis has been focused on how much does government get? Right. How much, you know, the, the, how much does it affect the debt? How much increased revenue do we get? What is was it due to the permanent fund over the course of time? Was it done? What does it do to future permanent fund payouts? All of it has been about what the impact is on government. None of it, none of it has been about what the impact is on uh, Alaska families and the Alaska economy. And I think I, I think that's just a waste of time. I think what they've done over the course of the year is just a waste of time. Right. I mean, they, 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 they've informed Alaskans about, about the impact of these things on government, but they've not informed Alaskans of the impact of these, of these various steps on Alaska families and on the overall Alaska economy. Well, and I think even those who criticize uh, your discussion and your passion about having a distributional analysis, even those that criticize that, the fact that they didn't even look at the effect on the economy overall, the private economy overall, is troubling because again, Iser and others have said the largest e impact on the economy. You know, if you're sure you don't want to get down into the 20% or the 80% of the lower, the top or the mid or whatever, what's the effect on the overall economy? Their number one concern very obviously is, uh, is what is the effect on the government economy? What is our take? What can we spend? Yeah. And Michael, I, you know, it, it, you, you can't, the way you do an economic analysis is you look at the distributional analysis first, because the economic analysis comes through, the economic impact comes through uh, whether those dollars are in the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families or not. So the, the economic impact of cutting the PFD is experienced through government keeping those dollars as opposed to those dollars going into the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families and them spending it in the in the in the private sector. So you you can't do an economic analysis without doing a distributional analysis. You may not want to talk about the distributional analysis for some reason, but you can't do the economic analysis. I mean, that's the way ICER did it in 2016. They looked at the they looked at what was being pulled out of the private sector and then what the impact of those dollars if that had gone into the private sector uh, through the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families, what the impact was uh, on on the overall economy. So you're doing both. I mean, you may not want to talk about one segment or another, but frankly, that's that's sort of like, you know, the, the house finance or ledge finance not wanting to talk about uh, 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 the impact on the on the economy and families. It's it's you're doing both. You might as well talk about. Oh, you should uh, talk about both. But 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 the point here is that neither the house nor the senate. Uh, have have I don't think ask ledge finance to do that analysis or at least talk about that analysis uh, in public. They've just all the all the focus has been on what's in it for government, what's in it for for our dollars, what does that do to the permanent fund long term? And frankly, when they ask what does it do to the permanent fund long term, what they're really asking is what does it do to government revenues long term? They really don't. They're not really even focused then. Right. On the impact on Alaska families. Right. And the overall Alaska How does that affect our piggy bank that we can draw from later on? That's what they care about at this point. Uh, and, and that's and that's to me, that's just outrageous, because what what is government for? Government is to make life better. Right. Is to make life better for families and, and is to make the economy stronger. That's what government's for. And 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 they're not. I mean, by stopping it at what's the impact on government, uh, they're not looking through to. You know what the priorities of government should be. What's the impact on families, and what's the impact on the overall economy? So, this long presentation that Ledge Finance went through, I think, was just a waste of time uh, because because it didn't tell Alaskans 
what the impact is on them. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Kevin McCabe in the chat room, uh, Representative McCabe, says they and ICER now totally ignore and disparage the multiplier of private money in the economy during their presentations as well. That was something that he noted. ICER? I, I doubt I doubt if ICER did that. It's, I mean, I, I, Ledge Finance certainly doesn't do that, but, I, but, I, but ICER has talked about the multiplier effect. Well, it's again, it, you know, I think it just goes to show more than anything else prioritization problems, right? They have one set of priorities. It seems like the Alaskan people have a totally different set of priorities. Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a deeper problem. Um, I mean, if, if Brad Keithley was king for the day and was wearing the crown right now and all that stuff, I mean, would this be number? <laughs> he's, he's, don't, don't touch the head. I mean, was that, that was, <laughs> that's it, right? I mean, that would be that, that would be one of the top priorities to say, you know, on, on an equitable balance, one in each hand, we've got a government economy and a, and a, and a private economy. We have to find some kind of balancing act, right? I mean, ICER did talk about that all the way back to when you and I first started talking about this in 2014 or 2015. They had a balance. What is the effect on the public economy and the private economy, and what are the best levers to pull? Yep, exactly right. I mean, every presentation, if we had a bill, every it, 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 if if I were king, every bill would have a threefold presentation. What's the effect on government? Okay, I, we we need to know that because we don't want to be you know creating an even deeper deficit out of out of some of these acts. What's the effect on government? What's the effect on Alaska families? And then what's the effect on the overall Alaska economy? And if you want to switch those two, I mean, one goes before the other. Right. You need to know the effect on families before you know the effect on, on the economy. But if you want to switch those two, that's fine. But it would be a threefold, it would be a threefold presentation. And and what we're getting out of the House and the Senate right now is just a, a just a single uh, data point, which is the effect on government. They know a private economy will wipe them out and show the total corruption and incompetence of government. Uh, Kevin says, I specifically asked questions to the fisc- in the fiscal policy working group. And the I guess uh, we was talking about ICER. And Kevin said, I specifically asked the question in the fiscal policy working group. And he sort of discounted my question. The last remaining ICER economist, his name escaped me, is worried about UA funding, I think, is what Kevin McCabe said. So, uh, because that's not Scott well, Goldsmith or, or anymore. So it's it's Musin Gutabi, isn't it? Or is it somebody else? No, Musin's moved on also. Uh, I think um, oh, the, the past uh, head of ICER, the guy who just retired, I think did the presentation to, uh, uh, to, the, to the working group. And I, um, I, I mean, you, you go to the 20, 2016 study, and there is clearly uh, uh, economic multipliers uh, in there. Different people use different multipliers uh, because they're using it off a different base. Um, and so uh, the ICER multiplier in the 2016 study, we, we talked about this a lot at the time, was 1.4 for every dollar that went into uh, for every dollar PFD dollar that went into the hands of middle and lower income Alaska family, or all Alaska families, uh, 1.4 uh, showed up in the Alaska economy. Um, there's, I mean, you got to. There's different ways. I mean, there's a multiplier if you're looking at the total effect, including the entire United States, because you can have a you can have an impact on on outside Alaska when people uh, spend money outside Alaska. There's a different multiplier if you're not taking into account uh, dollars that get absorbed into savings. Um, so there's a bunch of different numbers out there. McDowell does a number for uh, the oil industry that uh, a dollar spent in the oil industry that's entirely different than than what shows up in the ICER format. So um, it, the the important thing is is as long as you're doing a total study like ICER did in 2016, you're using the same sort of approach for. Uh, each of the uh, uh, each of the impacts and and ICER did in 2016. So I, I can't speak to what uh, to what the response was to Kevin, but uh, in the 2016 study, uh, which is the seminal study on impact on the overall Alaska economy, ICER clearly took into account uh, multiplier effects. Uh, John uh, says, I mean, this I agree with. Excuse me. Excuse me. I'm trying not to cough because if I cough, I'm going to pass out here. Hold on. 
oh my gosh, it almost got me and I would have uh, been a bit of bad day. John says, uh, what he said the role of government is for is very incorrect. The role of government is not to make things better. The role of government is to provide national security, local security, enforcement of third-party contracts and laws. Anything else is just extra, which in, in, um, in principle I agree with. I mean, the role of government has stretched so far beyond what it was originally intended for, and it's almost become just acceptable at this point to try and be all things to all people. Uh, that's part of our problem, right, Brad? Well, yeah, but I mean, even if even if you view the scope of government as just limited to national defense, it's still looking out for uh, uh, families. And I mean, the reason we have national de- defense is to look out for families and uh, uh, and the economy. So it's not... I mean, I didn't I didn't mean to imply that it's to spur the economy or right. it's to is to manipulate the economy. It's just I mean, the goal is to make sure <clears> that we have uh, a, a safe environment for Alaska families and a safe environment for uh, a, a supportive environment for the overall economy. It's just amazing what they can say is all, you know, for making us safe. It, health and welfare can be twisted into a variety of pretzels that really makes it uh Makes it hard to choose. That's number one. Um, it kind of leads us well into number two. We're actually running a little bit ahead of schedule here, unless you've got anything else on number one. This kind of segues no. nicely into number two, which is the House majority and ledge finance kind of ignoring all this. And it just continues with the latest piece, which, of course, was ha- highlighted in the uh, Fairbanks Daily News Miner uh, this last weekend. I know because everybody came up and talked to me about it when I was in Fairbanks this weekend. And that is Adam Wool's new plan which is not a new plan. He's had it this whole year, but for a 2.5% income tax on everybody to, uh, to make it all work out. Yeah. So Adam's had this bill, uh, since, uh, uh, well, since last uh, January, uh, and he's been working on it for longer than that. There was an ITEP study done last December, uh, uh, submitted to, uh, the, uh, the legislature on, uh, a flat tax and what and, and various impacts of the flat tax. Interestingly enough, the distributional analysis uh, uh, of a flat tax, not the economic analysis, because ITEP didn't do that, but uh, the distributional analysis of a of a flat tax uh, was done in a study last uh, last December. It's a very good study that that ITEP did, um, and so Adam submitted the bill last uh, January. That the the, uh, uh, the Fairbanks News Miner is catching up to it now. Basically, what Adam's bill does is uh, two things. Uh, one is uh, it does have a flat tax, a flat tax component uh, to raise a certain amount of revenue. I think that the target of the revenue, the option he's using is it raises $581 million, according to, uh, according to the ITEP analysis in, in the News Miner article. They, they round it to $600 million. Right. But the thing that the, thing that the News Miner uh, analysis doesn't, uh, or the thing that the News Miner article doesn't really go into, is the second component, which is a huge PFD cut. Uh, what Adam's bill does now, it's a little different than what he submitted in January, but what Adam's bill now is reduces the PFD to a combination of 10% uh, of the POMB draw. So instead of POMB 5050, it's POMB 1090. Um, and then adds in uh, 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 Kelly Merrick's proposal uh, to include a portion of the oil royalties uh, into uh, into the, the PFD. And you know, looking at the numbers, that really adds another 10% of the POMB draw. So it, while it's done differently, it's really POMB 2080. 2080 right uh, that is um, that, that's in his proposal so that's a that's a 1.9 so so the the flat tax uh, component is about 600 million the 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 PFD component is a 1.9 billion dollar cut you know, looking at FY22 numbers is a 1.9 billion dollar cut uh, from statutory PFD from from current law um, and and I think you know, so so the news miner article spends all this time talking about the the flat tax component of it, without really getting into what the it mentions it, but without really get into getting into the PFD cut component. And in the in the next segment, I, I want to go through a little bit what that looks like from a distributional standpoint, and uh, and what's really you know it's, it's sort of like an iceberg, right? The the flat tax is sort of sitting the portion sitting on top of the water. And then the PFD cuts this huge portion that's sitting underneath. And I want to sort of walk through 
uh, what that looks like. Brad, we were talking about number two of the weekly top three, which was Adam Wool's new, or not so new, but uh, I guess new to the news miner, discussion on uh, this 2.5% uh, uh, income tax. And you have some discussions and some uh, some uh, charts and some other things. You want to do some comparatives and talk about it, so I'm going to let you take it away here. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to try this again, see if I can do it in uh, in real time the way I did it during the uh, the break. Let's see. All right, hopefully, hopefully we're getting a a chart up there. Yep. Tell me, tell we, me when we it comes got up. it. We're all good. All right, so this chart is an analysis of uh, Representative Wool's HB 37 um, uh, from a distributional standpoint. What we've got on the chart is uh, the 20% income brackets, uh, lows on the left, lower middles next to that middle, upper middle, and then the last three are uh, the top 20% broken down into the next 15, the next four, and then the and then the top 1%. And and the impact of Representative Wool's uh, bill uh, comes in two parts. It comes in in terms of uh, in terms of the the flat tax that he's proposed, uh, but also in terms of the much bigger in terms of dollars, PFD cut uh, that uh, that's embedded in the bill. The red on the chart is the combination of those two, uh, both the, the combined effect of the of his flat tax uh, and the uh, and the uh, uh, the PFD cut. And as you can see on the chart, the impact on middle income Alaska families of the combined effect. He says it's a 2.5 percent flat tax, but the impact. Uh, on uh, on middle income families is 10% uh, as a share of income or 11%, 10.9% as a share of income. Upper income, upper middle is uh, 7.8, about 8% uh, in terms of the share of income that would go to government, share of adjusted gross income uh, that would go to government. Uh, the low, the lowest 20%, uh, more than 25% of the income of the lowest 25% would go to would go to government uh, under his proposal, mostly driven. Uh, by uh, by the PFD cut, very right. little of that twenty seven percent is uh, is coming from uh, uh, is coming from the flat tax. So it, 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 yes, he can say it's a two point five percent tax, but when you add in the in the PFD component, the PFD cut component, it becomes hugely regressive, uh, uh, as any uh, uh, PFD cut uh, uh, proposal is. The blue on the chart is is an analysis of what it would take uh, in terms of a true flat tax or flattish tax using uh, using his flat tax proposal uh, to raise the same amount of revenue. And instead, if you if you're trying to raise the revenue through uh, a true flat tax and only a flat tax, the flat tax would be would have to be about 7.5 percent. That's the amount. That's the percent of overall Alaska adjusted gross income. Uh, that's being taken by government uh, uh, through Representative uh, Wool's bill, uh, and then it would be a truish, uh, a flattish uh, tax, as uh, as shown in the in, in the blue uh, on the chart. His bill put put this another way: his bill does take about seven five seven point five percent of overall Alaska income, including the PFD, uh, the statutory PFD, takes about seven point five of overall Alaska income. And moves it to government, but it doesn't do it in a flat manner. Right uh, through the P through the PFD component, it takes a huge amount uh, of it from uh, from middle and uh, lower income Alaska families. And 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 the thing that's not uh, not analyzed in his bill, the thing that's not been analyzed by House Finance, and the thing that frankly I didn't I haven't had time to run through the charts either, is the impact on the overall Alaska economy. But when, so but when you take uh, that much income out of middle and lower income Alaska families, you're having a huge impact uh, on the overall uh, Alaska economy. So right. that that's, I mean, both of those things, the impact on Alaska families uh, and the impact on the overall Alaska economy, you can't find any mention of that uh, in uh, in either the bill or in the bill analysis or in Frankly, in the news miner uh, article as well. Well, what I really liked was your was your analogy of the iceberg. I mean, what what Adam Wool is, is pitching on the surface is the two and a half percent uh, is the two and a half percent of tax uh, as that's the tip of the iceberg. What we're missing underneath of that is 
the well below the surface of the water is all the money that they're taking, the stealth tax, as you were, of the taking of the permanent fund dividend. And I think that's what people are missing. And I don't know if that's intentional or not, but, you know, it always looks good on paper to say it's only a 2.5% flat tax, but all that stuff underwater is what cuts the hull out of your ship. You know what I mean? That's yeah, and that's an excellent point, Michael. I mean, what's really going on here? I mean, you can see that in the in the in the blue. You can see that in the flat tax. Uh, what what the flat tax would be if, if he was raising this money only through flat tax. So the the part above the 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 part of the iceberg above the water is two point five percent. That's his nameplate. Uh, that's what he says the uh, uh, the uh, the flat tax is. But but viewed it, viewed as the as the Alaska economy as a whole, there's another five percent. There's a double. Uh, amount sitting underneath the water. I mean, the total is 7.5%. So he's really pulling seven. He's pulling 7.5% out of the economy. 2.5% of that is what he's admitting to in terms of the flat tax, but the other 5% is coming out uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of a PFD cut, uh, and uh, and there's and there's no discussion of that. So this is something that we obviously need to be watching for. I mean, we knew that they were going to start pushing in this direction here. Uh, you know, we heard that with Bert Stedman talking about the 7525 and others at the 7525. And now we had we talked to to Ken McCarty about the 6535 that he's talking about. I mean, everything's moving off of 5050. We moved off of full statutory to the middle of the road in the 5050. And then, of course, everybody else crowded the field. And now we've got 90, 10 and 70, 30 and all this. I mean, it's all basically more for government in the long run. It, it is. I mean, we're th- there's a seven hundred million dollar, eight hundred million dollar difference uh, between uh, the statutory, it, at least in FY22, between the statutory PFD uh, and POMB fifty fifty. There's already been there's already a huge cut uh, in uh, in the in the PFD from from current law uh, incorporated in going down to POMB fifty fifty. And you know, and it really irritates me. When people say, you know, when people sort of act like, well, that's the starting point now. POMV fifty fifty is start is the starting point, right? And right. and 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 Ivy Spahn holds his, you know, uh, uh, House Ways and Means Committee bill goes to twenty five seventy five, and that's sold as a compromise, you know, now because uh, because the governor has redefined the baseline as POMV fifty fifty. I, it, it's it's I mean, people grab that and then and then and then want more, move more to government, take more out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and uh, that that's just I mean, right. and then they don't analyze what the impact is on middle and lower income Alaska families. and They don't am- analyze what the impact is on the on the overall Alaska economy. Well, maybe, of that. maybe they do. They just don't put it out there because they know what it would look like. That's the problem. Uh, let's move on to number three here, Brad. Uh, we're seeing the withdrawal uh, from the slope uh, on certain projects, and you're going to tell us what that spells for Alaskans. We got about four minutes here. There was an article in uh, uh, in Alaska Public Media, and frankly, I haven't seen it picked up anyplace else yet. Uh, that uh, that talked about Exxon giving up operatorship of Point Thompson uh, to Hillcorp, moving operatorship of Point Thompson to Hillcorp. Now, that's not Exxon's retaining ownership. Uh, and they still have, I think they have majority ownership um, in, in Point Thompson. Um, so they're not giving up ownership, but they're giving up operatorship. And operatorship in the oil and gas industry is a huge deal. I mean, with operatorship, basically you get to staff up and other people pay your staff, right? I mean, other people pay a, a portion of your staff because right. you're the operator of the unit. Right. You recover you recover your costs as operator from uh, from everybody else in the unit, proportionately from everybody else in the unit. Um, and it's a and it's an important deal. And operatorship is how you keep your your ear to the ground on new opportunities or on the potential for cost savings or on the potential for you know step outs from from where you are. Um, people fight uh, historically have fought hard uh, to get operatorship uh, in a unit. And and Exxon's now giving up operatorship of Point Thompson. They're they're the only place on the slope that they were operator. They're now going to move operatorship of Point Thompson over to Hillcorp. In in some ways, that's a good thing for Alaska because Hillcorp is a is a proven operator. They know how to grind out uh, costs. They know how to lower costs, frankly, by not having as many people, uh, not having as many redundancies, safety redundancies, for example. They know how to grind out costs, and so you know, to some degree, it's a good thing. They're also pretty good. Uh, at uh, at at you know scraping the rocks better and getting more oil or getting more uh, production out of uh, out of existing fields and that's good, 
But this is a huge sea change. I mean, it's it's Exxon essentially leaving the slope. Uh, Exxon was was for a long time the driver of the gas project. They were the head of the of the gas project uh, between the three producers when uh, when it was uh, very active in the in the early 2000 or 20 teens. Um, uh, really have a worldwide expertise uh, in uh, in LNG projects in in, in monetizing gas. Um, and they've really been very active in this stuff. And, and losing them is going to be a big deal. What was the reasoning, do you think, that Exxon, what was their stated reason for going out? And, and I mean, maybe it's good, but maybe it's not so good. What's, uh, what's your thoughts there? Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that Exxon gave a reason. I think they just, they, at least in the, uh, in the APRN uh, uh, web article or in the, in the news article, the Alaska Public Media news article, uh, they, just, they just said it was happening. But I think there's two things going on. One, Exxon's pulling back in globally. Uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, uh, turned down some projects that historically they would have taken. Uh, they had uh, they they uh, had a uh, board challenge, and they got some uh, new board members that weren't supported by management uh, recently in uh, in their last board election. So they've they've had a bit of a change there, um, and I think Exxon's pulling in globally and and beginning to. Uh, uh, sort of resize itself, if you will, uh, in the face of uh, climate change and in, in the face of uh, the potential for declining uh, oil and gas production. So uh, they're prioritizing. And I think, uh, uh, frankly, what's happened with the Alaska project, uh, Exxon always viewed it uh, as a gas project. Their operatorship, Point Thompson, as a key piece of a, of a gas project, uh, always viewed uh, uh, that's why they were up here. At least since uh, at least since the, uh, the around 2000, that's what that's how they viewed themselves as being as being up here. And I think, frankly, they're just giving up on it. I think they see that project is not going anyplace. Uh, they probably couldn't get what they wanted out of selling their interest in Point Thompson to Hillcorp, uh, but they just didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, keep the it. focus, keep people right. Um, involved in uh, in operating it going forward just didn't want to deal with it anymore so we'll keep our ownership let somebody else play with it and we'll come back to it when we can sell it off for what we want eventually yeah i i, I you know this is sort of uh my guess is they're going to let hillcorp get involved with it sort of see what they can do out of it let hillcorp come up with a valuation of it um uh let hillcorp hillcorp get more knowledgeable about it and then hopefully in, in, in Exxon's view, hopefully sell it, uh, sell it to Hillcorp. I, I think it's bad for Alaska from, from the standpoint, it's another indicator. We've talked about this on the show a lot uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the PICA project, oil searches, PICA project, not getting funding. Uh, I think it's another indicator that Alaska oil, uh, uh, North Slope is becoming something of a backwater uh, in the industry. It's transitioning to, uh, well, not even mid-majors. Uh, it's transitioning uh, to uh, to smaller companies, privately held companies, um, and uh, and and people don't view it um, uh, really as a growth uh, growth uh, opportunity uh, much anymore. And I think it's another uh, another indicator of uh, of that. Certainly makes Conoco's presence on the North Slope uh, even more important uh, mm-hmm. from that st- standpoint. And, right. Uh, and, and, and Hillcorp's uh, presence on the slope more. It, was this the indication more. of the beginning of the decline of the Alaskan oil industry as far as the major players at that point? Well, no, BP selling out to Hillcorp was was That was, was the big the one, right, yeah. The, the beginning of that. I think this is just another step, uh, uh, another step down that road. Um, the, uh, who was it? Um, uh, Willie says, Brad, how about a chart? And maybe this is your homework for next week. I mean, not that you don't have other things to do, but, uh, how about a chart showing legislative budget cuts versus PFD cuts over the last six years? That would be an interesting uh, chart, especially if you were using the CAFR. I don't know if you saw the article from, uh, must read the other day, and I can't remember who wrote it. I, I talked about it yesterday, but talking about the CAFR with the actual numbers, uh, you know, the bottom line, no BS, no spin uh, kind of a press release numbers on what the government was actually spending in the long run. That would make a very interesting chart, I think, in the long in the long run. Uh, yeah, Jim Crawford wrote that article. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, I have no end of of of, of a list of, uh, of of charts that I need to do, and and, uh, and and I'll put that on it. I guess I guess I should mention that I've started doing a chart of the week. 
uh, for Alaska landmine. So on Fridays, uh, there's going to be a chart of the week in Alaska landmine. And, See, and Willie else. Everybody wants to be a cool kid now. Now Landfield wants to get in on the Brad Keithley train. I see how it is. I see how it is. Yeah. Well, well, you know, I, I, I've really, I, I, I like explaining things in terms of charts, and, uh, yeah. and Landfield picked up on that and said, "Well, let's uh, let's let's include one a week in the in the land." Well, that's good. That's good. I mean, exposure for you and an exposure for the message. I don't always agree with Jeff, but uh, uh, it's good to get the message out there and at least have some exposure on it. So I appreciate that. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Look at us, man. We made it through two full segments in the whole techno whiz thing. And it's uh, I'm kind of ex- I'm kind of excited about it. I'm kind of proud about it. So. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty impressive. I, I need to work on the light cycling next yeah, time. Yeah, well, uh, that's that's okay. I mean, I've got one bright light on me all the time, so that's uh, that was something I had to work on right away, so no big deal. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate you being part of it today. Michael, as always, uh, as always thanks for having me. All right, good to talk with you again. We will see you uh, next week. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.